so I'll continue from last time. Uh, we were talking about uh, upper bounds for moments of L functions. And so everything that I'll say in this talk is uh, joint with uh, Maxim Rajivi. L slashes, okay. Both of them. <laughs> um, so I told you last time that uh, the principle here is, uh, is complementary to what I described earlier for lower bounds, where if you, if you have an asymptotic for some moment, you get lower bounds that are correct lower bounds for all higher moments. Here it's uh, the complementary principle that if you have an asymptotic for some moment plus epsilon, then you have the right lower bound for all smaller moments. And I'm going to illustrate this by talking about uh, one particular family. Let's think of the family of uh, uh, quadratic twists of an elliptic curve. So let's say something this is not so important to us, but uh, at the moment, so say you're given some elliptic curve E given by y squared as f of x for some cubic polynomial f over the integers, let's say. And, uh, and we want to look at the, those twists, uh, D, which are fundamental discriminants, for which the twisted curve E D, uh, the sign of the functional equation is 1. since in the other cases, the L function is trivially zero. And then we want to understand, uh, say, moments of, of L half uh, E twisted by chi D. Or uh, again, if you think of the, the analogy with, uh, with Selberg central limit theorem or these keating snaith conjectures, we might also want to understand the distribution of log L half E twisted by chi D. And uh, okay, so this is an example of a family where we can compute very little. So uh, usually you can compute one or two moments. In this case, one can actually compute exactly one moment is known. It's known. But this is known with uh, some degree of flexibility that you can put in uh, a short Dirichlet polynomial, in fact, even a fairly long Dirichlet polynomial, and still evaluate the first moment. So that's the one plus epsilon kind of situation that we know. So in particular, this, this, uh, the, for all, high, all moments larger than the first, you would get the right lower bound by the method of uh, uh, Rudnick and me and its extensions by Max and me. Now, so here, let me state the kind of results that we can prove. So first, uh, uh, since we know the first moment, I'll try to indicate that we can prove the following upper bound uh, for all k less than 1. But this is at most the right the conjectured asymptotic, which in this case is k times k minus 1 over 2. And secondly, so, so I indicated that in this, this uh, that there's the analog of the, or the there's the keating snaith conjectures, which is the analog of Selberg's theorem, which would say that if you look now at log L half E twisted by chi D, the, the conjecture of Keating and Snaith would be that this is approximately normal with mean uh, minus half times log log x and variance log log x. So I'm thinking of the discriminants d being of size about x. Okay. So this, as uh, at the end of the talk, Andrew mentioned that this is a very powerful conjecture because it implies Goldfeld's conjecture that if the sign of the functional equation is positive, then 
100% of the time, the, the rank is zero. So, so this is a refinement of that conjecture, if you like. And uh, so we- It's a conjecture, of course, but they're biased. You have to do within the family. It's all subjective. I mean, 50% of class people in what family? In this, well, I think he did conjecture for quadratic twists, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, just, uh, by twisting the character, you, you control the root number and can easily accomplish whatever percentage. By, uh, but, we are, but we are in this family where the sign is plus one, right? Okay. Suppose I want to give only for the, for the this multiple reduction, exclusive. And there's nothing in the conjecture about that. And that does, you know, because the additive reduction controls this, uh, the root number very easily. So, plain statement like that. But what are you disagreeing with? That 100% of the well functions are non zero here? or? Any of the conjecture. I can tell you that family of elliptic curves, if you've signed, you've signed one in the component, has percentage 100%. Sure, if you look at the family of rank two to this, then, then you'd be okay. You specialized family. Right, but I am specializing the family here for this particular family of quadratic twists with the sign of the functional equation being one. This conjecture is true and it implies this conjecture of Goldfeld that 100% of the time the rank is zero. And I don't know the history of it, so I mean, if you think that somebody made, it's not a deep, it's not a, yeah. It's a simple, in my opinion, meaningless conjecture. Okay. <laughs> Let's that's between you and Mr. Goldfeld. <laughs> okay, so, so, so you know, proving, proving this Keating-Snaith conjecture is, is quite hard because even, let's say, if you assume GRH, we don't know how to prove that 100% of the time these are non-zero. But we can, but what we can prove is one half of, uh, of this Keating-Snaith conjecture, namely that we can prove that there's an upper bound so, okay, so let me state this. Uh, uh, I'll still interrupt and steal your time a little bit. Okay. Because uh, actually, Harald in his thesis has a real good result about that. Because when he did. did it, I, I agree, Henrik, but it's not for this family. He, he got his conjecture, right? Right? They remember depending on the matrix for this thing. Yes, but this is what this is about what we're about. It's for, for, for more complicated families. Yeah. The root number does not do anything interesting for quadratic twist. Was the one case that was well understood. So maybe, maybe to make the point, uh, the root number in this family is very simple. It just depends upon the progression that d is, that d lies in. If the conductor of the curve, uh, let's say the conductor of the curve e is fixed to be some number n, so maybe I should also specify here that d is something that let's assume that it's co-prime to to n and also is odd. And then it's a very simple thing to write down what the the sign of the functional equation is here, and it just depends on progression. It changes by twisting by some two characters, so you can easily control it. It's right. not a big deal. In this case. It's, it's what my brother, you have know, you know, a lot of other reduction that's hard. And to do it for, for purely multiple reduction, like, like Harold did, at least in his lemma, some of the pieces, then it's a challenge, not just that. Okay. So, so in this case, what we can prove is that if you look at the, the number of discriminants d up to size x that lie in this uh, that lie in this uh, with that have uh, sign of the functional equation one, and let's look at those for which uh, the log of the L function. Uh, so we want to so we want to take into account that the mean is expected to be this negative number. So let's add let's so let's subtract the mean, which is the same as adding half log log x uh, divided by the variance. And let's count those for which uh, this quantity is big. Now, so. We don't know, so you might, so this kind of uh, assumes, for example, that this value is not zero, so you can't prove a lower bound for this object, but what we can prove is an upper bound for this object, that this is at most as large as the number of discriminants up to x lying in, lying in E times what we would guess, which is the Gaussian Uh, 
minus little o of 1. So in other words, this is uh, so what we would like very much would be for an equality here, which we don't know how to prove, but we can prove a one-sided bound towards that conjecture. Now, now for this family of quadratic twists, you can get uh, some kind of interpretation of this result uh, for orders of the Tate Sharp Ravage group. So let's uh, assume, if you like, uh, the Birch Swinnett and Dyer conjecture. But you really don't need to assume all of the Birch Swinnett and Dyer conjecture. You're only assuming it for rank zero twists, where it's almost a theorem, but not quite. So, uh, yeah, but uh, the, only, the only thing is that the, so almost all of it is known. The group is known to be finite. But on the other hand, we don't know exactly what powers of very small primes divide the group. So you can't really control the all of the order of it, you, you know, because you don't know how many powers of 2 divide it or 3 divide it. It's, it's, you know, I tried to look in the literature for some clean statement of this, but it doesn't really seem to exist. And, uh, Sorry, for, for, for what I'm going to write down. Oh. That, this is, that this is equal to, to so it's what would be conjectured by Birch, Swinnett, and Dyer, so that this should be equal to this L value uh, times various uh, uh, so the square of the of the torsion group over Q, and then there is some real period omega of t, and then there is some Tamagawa factor Tamagawa, which I think is. Uh, Roughly correct. So, so we know how to understand this. Uh, this is some bounded object, which is not very uh, hard to understand how this behaves as a function of d. The real period, roughly speaking, grows like 1 over square root of d. So in other words, this just goes to the numerator, square root of d times, uh, times the L value. And then the last thing to understand is this uh, Tamagawa factor. And sorry. So okay, so the Tamagawa factor, it uh, it factorizes as a product over various primes of some function T P of D. So it's a it's a it's a local calculation, and uh, most of these factors are one. And you essentially have to worry only about the primes uh, p that divide d. Maybe you also have to worry about the primes that divide the, the conductor n, but that's a fixed set of primes. We don't have to worry about it. So if p divides d, then these numbers t p of d can be described as uh, 1 plus the number of solutions to the congruence f of x is 0 mod p. Where this is the, the the polynomial that appears in the definition of our curve, y squared is f of x. Okay. Now, so now you can see that uh, that the conjecture of Keating and Snaith on log normality of this uh, should be translated to a conjecture on the log normality of Sha, as you vary in this family of quadratic twists. So, well, everything is easy except for this uh, Tamagawa factor. And the Tamagawa factor is not so hard because it only depends in a, in a nice way on the primes that divide, divide d. Okay? So, so if you carry that out, then the conjecture that the, that Max and I make is the following. So you have to understand how these Tamagawa factors behave. So, uh, let k be the field generated by the two torsion points of, of E. So this is some, uh, some field whose degree over Q is either 1, 2, 3, or 6. So it's a Galois field. And the Galois group of, uh, of k over Q, let's say, is, is some group G. And the Galois group is a subgroup of uh, GL2F2, if you like. Or let's, uh, I'm going to think of it as a, 
subgroup of S3. So it could be the trivial group, or it could be generated by a two cycle, or a three cycle, or it could be all of S3. And then we can define the following uh, parameters. Uh, I'm going to call C of G to be 1 plus the number of fixed points of G. Interpreting this as, a, as an element in S3. So this could be a number which is either uh, 1, 2, or 4. Exactly as uh, this could be a number which is uh, 1, 2, or 4, always. So that's supposed to be like these, uh, uh, like these TPs. And then I want to define two parameters, uh, mu of E. So this is going to be the mean of the, of the tate chaffer group group uh, of the, in this log normality conjecture that I want to make. This minus 1 half is the minus half from the keating snaith conjectures. And then it will be modified by uh, the expected value of this log C of G. So that's the factor coming from these Tamagawa factors which appear in the denominator. And then the variance is going to be defined as, uh, well, the keating snaith variance would, would have a 1 for the log log x. And then uh, there should be a variance coming from these Tamagawa factors, which is, which is this. So this is, a, this is the kind of thing that you would expect if you play around with the Chebotarov density theorem and a simple erdish katz type argument. An erdish katz type argument will tell you that, that this, this kind of object or the logarithm of it is Gaussian with a certain mean and a certain variance. Uh, this would be the mean and that the variance. Okay? And then if you put everything together, then the conjecture would be that then uh, as D varies in this family, family E, uh, uh, let me say log of sha E D uh, divided by square root of D, that's from this uh, real period, the size of the real period, that this is uh, approximately normal with mean mu of E times log log x and variance uh, sigma of E squared times log log x. So that's the conjecture. And this is kind of uh, related to some work by uh, Delaunay, who had some some somewhat related conjectures that he made for moments of Shah of ED, but he didn't quite formulate it in this, in, in this uh, sense of being log normal. Now, and uh, towards this conjecture, what we can prove is, uh, again, we can prove uh, one half of this conjecture. Namely, you can, you can get an upper bound for the frequency of large values. Bigger than. What are the values of mu and sigma in each case? There are four possible values. They're written down in our paper, right? But you know, this is a kind of a unified way of thinking about what all these four values are. But well, clearly, if E has complete two torsion, we can all figure out what this is. It's just half minus log four for mu, and then one plus log four squared, right? And then for the other cases, you have to kind of work out what they are. There's no I mean, as I said, we wrote down all these four, four, four cases. Uh, you don't see any obvious pattern in, in terms of what they are. They're, ju they're just, this is one way of describing it. Like, I think I also, I mean, I, I found it convenient to describe it just in terms of S3. Like, uh, I didn't, and there's some silly ways in which you can try to describe it in terms of GL2F2, which is the same group, but 
right, which is maybe more natural if you think of the two torsion points. But there's nothing terribly, I don't know anything terribly illuminating about it. I asked Brian Conrad about it as well, and he didn't have a very illuminating expression either. So, so let's think of uh, this plus uh, minus mu of phi times log log x over the variance, so sigma of e square root of log log x. The, the proportion of time for which this is bigger than v is at most what you would expect, the number of discriminants d up to x, d and e, with So the easy parts of these conjectures are done. So somebody has to do the hard parts <laughs> of showing that these are that these do actually match. With less renormalization, with meaning not dividing by the square root of log log x, but something a little bit more. I mean, the point being that like I said, it's a mixture of something that's really Gaussian and something that's really Poisson. No, the other one is also Gaussian. No, but by Erdős Katz, right? Because it's like Erdős Katz. It's right. Really better approximated with a Poisson Oh, so you, yeah, okay, there's your mod Gaussian theory, or, right? But, uh, uh, okay, that's for you to say as so. well. <laughs> right, no, I, I don't, yeah. Technique give anything if you renormalize by something slightly less than square root of log x, or is it the natural? This is the natural way to normalize, I think, uh, in this case. Uh, you could do other things, like you could, you know, in some sense, the Tamagawa factor is an artifact of the fact that we are looking at all numbers rather than just to say prime discriminant, um, right? And, and we can prove analogs of our theorems for prime discriminants also, and we can prove an upper bound result. In that case, all this kind of mu e and sigma e will disappear, and they will just be get replaced by one by one. But uh, it was kind of nicer to write down something which has four cases rather than something that has one case. You still assume BSD, right? In this, we assume BSD for uh, rank zero curves which I think of as a mild assumption because it might be removed any day, but, but so far not. Right. Yeah. Okay, so, so let me tell you something about the, the proofs of these, uh, of these theorems, and then I'll try to connect it back also with, uh, with the conditional theorems that we know about how to prove for moments where we can say if you assume GRH, you can prove the right upper bounds for all moments, uh, thanks to my earlier work and Harper's recent work. And these techniques also give you uh, a way of thinking about that. They're actually quite closely related to, uh, to Harper's work, but we were working on this. Uh, we, had, we had these two results independently and, uh, and realized that they were very close to each other. Now, so let me, uh, let me start maybe with the with the, the upper bound for the central limit theorem, because the proof is uh, the proof is in some ways uh, uh, extremely simple, and in fact the same techniques would also give much simpler proofs of Selberg's original theorem on the normality of uh, log zeta half plus it. And uh, the proof is also kind of going backwards in history a little bit, because. Uh, in problems involving the zeta function, a uh, hundred years back, people started thinking about these problems by, by mollifying using Euler products. This is the work of uh, Bohr and Jensen and others uh, very early on. And then as time progressed, people started replacing uh, the Euler products by Dirichlet series, uh, like Selberg's theorem on mollification and so on. And now we're going to go backwards and replace Dirichlet series by Euler products again. So Dirichlet series are much easier to deal with in certain sense, but Euler products are really much more flexible in thinking about many of these, uh, these kinds of problems. And it's also related to sieves in a way that I'll explain. Uh, so, so let's, uh, so I, in, in say in our discussion of Selberg's central limit theorem, I made the case that you can try to write down the logarithm of the zeta function and pretend that it's given by a Dirichlet series and then compute moments of that Dirichlet series. Uh, restricted somewhere. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to define uh, P of D to be uh, the sum of AP over root P 
chi d of p. And p goes up to some small point, uh, so, so up to something like, let's say, x to the 1 over log log x squared. So it's a very small power of x. Okay? Now, I claim that, that this object, I can understand everything about it on average. So if I, if I average over, over d up to some point x, with d being in my uh, set of uh, fundamental discriminants e, I can compute as many moments of p of d as I like. I can compute the kth moment of this, and I can evaluate this, can evaluate this. So a of p is, uh, I have my L function for the elliptic curve, which I'm going to write as a n over n to the s. Okay, so, so, so these are, and these are normalized in such a way that AP is at most uh, two. It's the, it's the normalization. Okay. So, so we can evaluate this for a wide range of values of, of k. So for all k up to uh, log log x squared, essentially. Let's put over 10 here if you want to make the case that it's a very small Dirichlet polynomial that you're trying to average. When you expand this out, you get terms which only go up to x to the one tenth, and then you can ex ex you can evaluate any Dirichlet polynomial that you like of that of such a short Dirichlet polynomial over over this. Now, and what will the answer be when we try to evaluate this? Uh, if you expand it out, so when we average over these uh, real characters, you get recall that we get a contribution only when you are averaging over uh, over a square square value q d of uh, uh, chi d of L is uh, small unless L is a square where there's a main term. Right. So if k is an odd number, then when you expand this out, you get an odd number of primes that appear here, appear here. And so you get complete cancellation. So the odd moments all vanish. And what happens to the even moments when you expand this out to an even power you need to have a product of p1 to pk, k is even, let's say, multiplying out to be a square. And the best way in which you can have k primes multiplying out to be a square is that if half the primes match with the other half of the primes. And the number of ways in which you can pair those off is basically the same as the Gaussian. It's a, it's so, so these moments will, will work out, and they will match the moments of a Gaussian. The mean of the Gaussian would be zero, because uh, if you just take the first moment of p, it's zero. Uh, but the variance will be, well, you need these primes to match with some other primes, so you get a sum over p up to this point, x to the 1 over log log x squared, ap squared over p. And by rankin selberg this is just asymptotic to uh, log log x. So you can see why log log x is, uh, is very good for these problems because it's really log log of x to the 1 over log log x squared, but that's exactly the same as log log x with very little error. Okay, so, so if I take this uh, short truncated uh, truncation of the logarithm, at least formally, then that truncation has a Gaussian distribution with mean 0 and variance log log x. Okay, the mean is zero because I did not include here the p squared terms, which would be what would contribute the minus half log log x. Okay, so I'm trying to explain this theorem. So, So suppose, so suppose we want to count a discriminant for which this condition holds, right? So, 
uh, let's call this star. So suppose star holds. Then I claim that one of the following, following must happen. Either this, polyno this uh, P of D is bigger than V minus epsilon times square root of log log x. So after all, this is really what I would like, because I would like to say that this logarithm of the L function really behaves like this polynomial P of D once I subtract out this mean, which is from the P squared terms. Okay, So that's really what I would expect. Uh, and then I'll make a slightly technical condition, I'll exp which I'll explain a little. So, uh, or maybe that this is, happens to be very small. This, uh, this is just a nuisance. It's not very important to think about this. Or what must happen is that is that one and two fail. But it still happens. It still happens that uh, if you take L half e twisted by chi d times uh, log d to the half, that's the mean, times uh, x pof minus p of d. So the assumption is that this quantity is big. And we are also assuming that this quantity is, is not too small. So this quantity must still be bigger than uh, the exponential of epsilon times square root of log log x. So this must still be pretty big. So one of these three cases must happen. And then if I can estimate the prob probability with which these cases happen, then I'm happy. Well, the first case we know already because I know that p of d is uh, normal. With the, with the right variance and the right mean now. So the probability with which this happens is exactly dominated by the Gaussian. <coughs> it's actually equal to the Gaussian. OK? Well, it's not quite the Gaussian. But more or less. It's a, yeah, no, more sorry, or less, right. it's not equal. Uh, it's approximately the Gaussian. OK. So I didn't realize that you were inviting other people to heckle me as well. <laughs> as an organizer, I mean, OK. <laughs> OK, so now this, on the other, this is also very easy to handle. Uh, if, you, if you just use the fact that you know, this normalized by square root of log log x is Gaussian, log log x is bigger than square root of log log x. So therefore, this is still in the tail of the Gaussian. So this happens, happens rarely. So now the last thing that you have to do is to wonder how often can it happen that this, that this to quantities gets large. Okay, now now one way to understand that would be to to look at the first moment. times this x of minus p of t. Let's forget about the log x. If I, can, if I can evaluate this, and if this turns out to be small, then I know that it's not going to be very often that this product times the log x, log d to the half, it gets large. Okay? So bounding this, so evaluating this would be enough. But now, this is not so easy to evaluate because uh, this is what I mean by taking a, an, a product, a, a product with, uh, not with a Dirichlet series, but with an Euler product. This is like the Euler product of the primes up to some point of some function, right? Okay. If you modify that by metric, the magic, you couldn't be able to take the inverse. That's, what that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly why we why we deal with Euler products and not with Dirichlet series, right? So that's the trick. But so Euler products have, have this advantage that I, I'm able to kind of invert the exponential of this, which I would not be able to do with Dirichlet series, as Henrik points out. But we can get 
we can get back the Dirichlet series from the Euler product too, right? And we use now a very simple uh, calculus argument. If x is small, then e to the x is actually well approximated by its Taylor series. Right, so if you write down the Taylor series of e to the x, it's going to be a good approximation to e to the x, provided x is not too big compared to where you approximate. Let's say x is less than uh, L over e squared or something like that. L over 10. This is easy enough to verify. But now we are exactly in this case where we're going to assume if 1 and 2 fail, it means that p of d is small. It's, it's a little bit large. It's not too small in the negative direction. So therefore, I can take, so where was p of d? It was uh, up there. So therefore, uh, let, OK, let me, uh, maybe let's say I, I defined it by taking d up, p up to x to the 1 over 10 log log x squared. I forgot my 10 as usual. OK, instead of 1 over log log x. But you see, I can now, can now replace, so using this, I can replace x pop minus p of d by the sum over uh, j goes from 0 to uh, log log x of minus 1 to the j over j factorial p of d to the j. In the case that I'm interested in where 1 and 2 fail, this is a good approximation to the exponential of minus p of d. If you make this an even number, what you have here is also going to be always positive. So that also is a useful thing for us. So instead of, instead of evaluating this moment, which I don't know how to evaluate, I can replace this essentially by a Dirichlet series approximation and then compute the moment. And that's enough for us. And the key fact that you want to, that you want to realize here is that uh, since I chose this p to be so small, even taking this to the power 2 log log x, is only going to make me something only of size x to the 1 over 5 log log x, which is a very short Dirichlet polynomial. So I can evaluate everything. Okay? So, so that's the idea of the proof. And to prove the other central limit theorem for, uh, for Sha, you just, it's, a, it's a very similar argument to this. You combine this with an erdős katz argument to prove that the Tamagawa factors behave nicely. And then you also have to worry that the Tamagawa factors don't interfere with the L function, but that's easy enough to, to arrange as well. OK. So now I will try to describe quickly uh, the argument for our four moments. Yep. Uh, and, uh, and the experience in the literature when you modify the linear data functions by like all the right. they lose some of the family, it's not yeah. the right perfect modification. Okay. And they said that with the magic said that smoothing was critical there. Yeah. And now you boom, it's going to you don't lose anything there. Yeah? So here you will lose something, but you don't care what you lose. But in the next argument, I will show you why you lose nothing. Okay? So uh, and it's connected to the silver gam. It's a, it's a, so okay. So as Henrik says, the, the fact that, P of, that we stop p of d at some very small power of, of x usually means that there will be some log associated with this. In fact, that's true. You would lose some powers of log log. But that's OK, because this e to the epsilon root log log x is much better than any power of log log that you need to lose. Okay? But next, I want to say that we can get these sharp bounds for moments of L functions where you cannot lose these powers of log log. So let me, say, let me tell you how that argument works. And then I'll explain where the argument, in some sense, comes from. Uh, so, well, maybe let me explain to you where the argument comes from, and then, and then we'll see. So you, you can see. So the argument really comes from uh, Brunsev, which, uh, which Henrik started talking about today a little bit. But uh, so let's think of the very first Brunsev, which is the, uh, the pure Brunsev. Suppose you want to count the number of primes up to x, and you want to sieve by the primes up to some number z. Okay? So you want to count the number of primes up to x, uh, sieving by 
by the primes up to some number z. So, and you try to do this by, by inclusion exclusion. And then you would want to understand something about uh, d divides n, d divides the product of the primes up to z, mu of d, right? So this is the, 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 the sieve of Eratosthenes. And Brun's idea was that you could get an upper bound here by restricting yourself to, to, to those d's for which uh, you stop at an even number of steps in inclusion exclusion. And then this is Brun's upper bound for, for the number of primes. So, and this is a very powerful method. And what is important here is how you choose the value k, right? How far do you have to go? So now there are two balancing forces when you carry this argument out. One is at each stage in the sieve when you, when you have your ADs, you have an error term which is of size bigger of one in this case. So the total error that you have in the sieve will be uh, on the order of, say, the number of integers up to x, all of which have at most 2k prime factors, all of the prime factors going up to z. So it's at most z to the 2k, taking a very crude bound for this. And then there's going to be a main term, which is going to look like the sum of d divides p of z, d at most x. And then you'll have uh, mu of d over d. And well, this condition maybe is not important. There's still the condition that omega d is at most 2k, right? And the question is, you know, is this going to approximate for you nicely, which we would like, we want this, uh, is this going to approximate the product of the primes up to z, 1 minus 1 over p, which it should, right, if it's going, if it's going to be a good serve. So, okay, so this is, so this is, so you want to choose k large enough so that this is true, but k small enough so that this error term is not too big, right? So that's the, that's the game in Brun's serve. Now, and the original idea of Brun Henrik, this is not a historical comment, just a, just a sketch. Okay, so, so, okay, so what do you want? So, so let's pretend, let's think of this product up to, up to z. Well, morally, this is, like, this is like thinking of the exponential of minus the sum p up to z, one over p, right? And if I think of terms here with uh, omega d is some j, d divides p of z, uh, minus one to the j over d, let's say. This is like taking the Taylor expansion of this and taking the jth coefficient. Right? So therefore, what you see is that this will approximate that if the first 2k terms of the Taylor approximation to the series will approximate that, okay? And the question is, when will the first 2k terms in the Taylor series approximate this exponential? Well, k has to be larger than this sum, which is just log log z. So in other words, we get a, we get a good approximation here, so this is good if k is bigger than log log z. Okay. So, so now, okay, so now we can see what Brun's argument would be. Uh, k is like log log z, so z has to be, so if this is to be small, so z has to be like chosen to be something like x to the 1 over 10 log log x, and then choose k to be uh, 2 log log x, and then you're done. So you have a sieve that works. Now the only problem with this sieve is that you are not able to sieve up to some small power of x, which, which, which is what we would like in order not to lose log logs, but we have to stop at this much smaller power of x, okay? But now, but now you can actually iterate this pure Brun surf. So you, so you can, so for free you can sieve up to x to the one over 10 log log x. Now let's, the next step that I'm going to do is that 
I'm going to use this so first. Uh, D divides PZ, Z is x to the 1 over 10 log log x, uh, whatever. And let's say this is this integer part of it so that it's even. So I take this, and then I put in my next set of primes, which are going to be those that divide. Uh, so P divides D implies that P is now going to lie. So you'll see what I want to do here. 10 log log x, and it goes up to x to the 1 over 10 log 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 x. And now you see that I can get away with this by only going up to twice uh, log 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 x. OK. So I claim that I can do this with no loss as well. Because once again, the, the numbers involved are only going to be of size x to the 1 tenth here, another x to the 1 tenth here, maybe going up to x to the 1 fifth. I'll want to do this carefully if I want, don't want the exponents to add up to more than x. So the error terms will be completely under control. And why will truncating up to this triple log be a good approximation? Because if you sum the reciprocals of the prime in this range, it's going to be extremely small. It's only going to be like x to the 1 over triple log x now, instead of double log x. And now you can keep iterating this. Can't you just in one step by the integration? But at each stage, you get some number of primes, right? But OK, I want to do it this way because I want to, you know, this is what I'm going to transport to the moment bound. OK? So, and then I, I keep iterating this. So, well, OK, keep doing the same thing. So in other words, you kind of, uh, so maybe you start out with some L1, which might be something like uh, 100 log log x. So, so, and then you take L2, which is going to be log of L1, or 100 times that, and then L3, which is 100 times log of L2, uh, and so on. Okay? And then at each stage, you use the primes p that are going to lie between x to the 1 over, let's say, 10 L1 squared, and then here they're going to lie between uh, x to the 1 over 10 L1 squared, and x to the 1 over 10 L2 squared, and so on. OK? And, OK. And so in this case, you would take numbers with uh, twice L1 prime factors, at most twice L1 prime factors, twice L2 prime factors, and so on. OK, so that's a, uh, that's a version of a, of a Brun serve. It's kind of a pure Brun serve. And it will, not lose any, it will not lose anything more than a constant. So you will gain back any powers of log log that you lose in the usual Brun serve. Now, so now you can take this argument and use it to prove the bounds on moments. Because I can basically replace, so I can take, when I want to use an Euler product, I will use an Euler product in some range from here, and some range from there, and so on. In different, I'll split up my Euler product into different pieces. So let me write, uh, take these Ljs, and let me write Pj of d to be the sum over the primes that lie in this, in one of these intervals, uh, x to the 1 over uh, 10 Lj minus 1 squared to And what I would like to say is that, OK, so, so I want to be able to, so I want to say, get, get a bound. So I want to, uh, I'm going to write down a kind of a pointwise bound. For some kth moment, and I want to write down a bound which is going to involve, uh, which is going to involve an interpolation with the first moment 
uh, times some Dirichlet polynomial plus some other Dirichlet polynomial. Okay, that's going to be the that's going to be the aim, and I don't quite know how to do that because uh, if I put in a Dirichlet series here, I would like to put the inverse of the Dirichlet series there, and that I don't know how to do. I can't put inverses, but I can do it with Euler products. So I could take L half E D to the K, right? And if I had Euler products, I could try to express a bound. This needs to be worked out carefully. I'm running out of time a bit. So I want to be able to write something here with x of k minus 1 times these Euler, Euler factors, p1 of d plus p2 of d plus so on. And then plus the exponential of the kth power of these Euler products. This is true, but I can't evaluate anything at this stage. Why would I be keeping one function just on this k minus one divided by k So k is going to be a real number less than one, right? Less than one, and and the only and I, I can only evaluate the first moment in this family, right? So yeah. so k is a number less than one. So this is some negative exponent, if you like. Um, I'm going to increase the moment power. I can write down some interpolation inequality, but I can't do it with Dirichlet series. I can do it with Euler products. I can write down a bound of this type, but I cannot do it. In number theory tradition, k is an integer. K is, k is between 0 and 1. <laughs> right. OK. So, well, it was also an integer in various places, like in the kth moment there. But it's very right. right. <laughs> Okay, so so now, so now I have to I have to worry about these. What do you mean? What happens if the zero value is zero? This is still an inequality. Some zero number zero is bounded by something here, which is non-zero. Yeah, I mean the left hand side is much more zero than the right hand side. It's an upper bound. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, no, no, the upper. The, excuse me, sorry. The right hand side is more zero. No, 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 no. So it's interpolating between L half and one. One, but the second term is yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it'll be a true inequality. I haven't written down the true inequality, but I can write down a true inequality. Yeah. So what do I want to? So how do I want to set this up? The idea is that I will replace each of these exponentials by uh, the exponential of uh, one of these, say, k minus one or k doesn't matter what, p j of d. I will now want to replace this by the Taylor series going up to, to the L over L factorial, with the Taylor series going up to these numbers Lj. Right, so Lj as here. All the Lj's were even as well. So if you take them to be even, you can, you can replace one of these exponentials by this as an upper bound. Most of the time, not always, but most of the time. Okay, so this is so. If you like, this is the idea of the Brunsov transported to this transported to this situation. So once you once you do that, then you will be left with Dirichlet series, and there will be short Dirichlet series as in as in this Brunsov argument, and therefore you can evaluate everything that you want. Okay, and and then and if you arrange this carefully, there are no losses in the method, and you get exactly tight bounds. So, okay, I'll just use this. Okay. So, so I have only a few minutes, so let me. So maybe I won't tell you the simple real analysis that goes into making inequalities of this type. It's not, it's not very hard to, to make that precise. So let me tell you in the last few minutes how you can get bounds for moments if you're willing to assume the Riemann hypothesis. 
and you can get tight bounds for all, all moments. Assume GRH. So the key ingredient here is, uh, is that uh, if you look at the log of L half uh, E twisted by chi D, for example, then, well, this log might have singularities whenever this function happens to be zero. But when it happens to be zero, this is actually to be interpreted as negative infinity. And we are only interested in upper bounds for this. So the singularities which come from zeros of L functions on the half line are helpful to you when it comes to getting upper bounds. And they don't hurt. So, one can, so that might convince you that you can prove a general upper bound for this logarithm, uh, taking the values up to some point x. Uh, you, then you would have the term from the, from the prime squares, which will give you something of that type. And x is a, is a free parameter. You can take x as you please. Of course, if you choose it to be very small, you have to pay an error term, which is going to be of the size uh, log of the conductor, log of capital X, divided by log of little x. So if x is, a, is like a power of the conductor, there's only a constant loss. But the smaller you take x, the bigger your loss is. So this is a lemma that I proved uh, in my work on, on, on moments. And, uh, and it's very flexible because you have complete freedom of how you can choose this x. Okay? So, so, now you, so now you want to find an analog of this Brunsov argument, uh, which is, uh, so okay, so there are two things. One is that you can just take, you can take x to be some small power. Uh, if x is like capital X to the one over k, then you can compute the first k moments of this sum. So if you play around with this, so by, by choosing x, little x small enough, you can compute as much as you want about this. And then you can prove, you can make precise a version, a uniform version of the Selberg type uh, central limit theorems. So in this way, you can prove that the frequency, that the number of d for which uh, log uh, L half E twisted by chi D is bigger than some number, uh, well, times log x to the half, let's say, that this is bigger than e to, the, e to the V. You can prove that this is, behaves like E to the minus V squared over 2 log log x. Uh, this is true for fixed values by, well, this is not known at all, but this is true for fixed values by, for example, this theorem of Max and I that I first explained. But it's now going to be true if you just want some crude bound of this type, maybe with the one plus little o of one, then this will be true uniformly for v going up to uh, log log x times log 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 x. So that's the range in which uh, I established this. And, uh, and now if you recall the calculation that we did yesterday on the connection between Selberg's theorem and, and the bounds for moments, you only need to know some theorem like this for v being k times log log x, where k is the moment that you're trying to evaluate. And this log 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 x is still going to infinity, so it'll beat every k. OK, so this, this argument will give you uh, the right upper bounds apart from this log to the epsilon. The idea of Harper in getting rid of the log to the epsilon is that you don't have to go to the central limit theorem and then use that to get a bound for moments. You can instead deal with moments all the time, you know, by themselves uh, from the start. And that argument is very closely related to this, uh, the argument that I sketched here. Uh, the idea is that you, So the idea is that you take a, a, series, a sequence of values of x. Maybe the first one will be like uh, x to the uh, 1 over log log x squared, and then x to the 20 over log log x squared. This is Harper's choice. And then x to the 400 over log log x squared, and so on. And you consider the Euler product up to these heights, 
and you check at any point of time if the, oil, if the sum of the involved in the oil product is small or not. If it is small, you try to use the oil product un until that stage. And if it's big, you kind of stop at the first place that, you, that, uh, that you're allowed to use and then estimate the tail dif differently. Uh, this is not a, an elaborate treatment of this, but I am out of time, so I'll stop now. Thank you. Can you repeat what is the main result? What is the main result? Well, I gave you, uh, so there were three things that I mentioned. One was the, the bounds that you get tight upper bounds for moments, for moments up to one, up to the first moment in this family. And the second one was that uh, you get the, you get one half of the keating snaith conjectures. So you get upper bounds uh, for the keating snaith central limit theorems. So conjectures, that you, that you can prove that the, that the frequency of large values is dominated by the expected frequency, which is that of the Gaussian. And the third one was the argument for the analog for Sha, which we conjecture is going to be log normal with a certain mean and a certain variance in this family. And once again, we can prove an upper bound uh, for the large values of this, the, a tight upper bound for the large values of this. And then the other result, which I didn't say very much, was that on GRH, we have the right upper bound now for all values of k uh, by work of Harper refining my work. Yeah. Um, it's not a very well formulated question, but with these complicated conditions with number of prime factors and so forth, is there, have you thought about trying to get rid of them by putting in you know, some factor that will go to zero if the number of prime factors is big in any interval? Mm -hmm. No, so the, the flexibility of the method is really to kind of think of the exponential series as, as an approximation, right? Uh, I mean, you can, you can rig it in a way in which, you know, if the size of the prime factor, you can smooth it in terms of the size of the prime factor. But uh, the number of prime factors you want to kind of keep, well, I mean, you can play around with other versions of the combinatorial serve, and I'm sure you can, one can maybe strengthen this. But, yeah, but there is some, I mean, uh, okay, I don't know what, what the right answer is. It, you know, it's like, it is kind of a, a s strangely backwards argument. It's going back in terms of, you know, as a sieve, this will be weaker than any sieve that anyone could write down, right? Uh, but, it's, but it actually gets the right result in this case. So. Yeah. Yes. What about the prime, if you look at the family uh, of, the of prime discriminants? Yeah, we can do that too. And, and, the, and the reason for that, so in the, in the case of primes, it's interesting that you, we, cannot, we cannot handle the first moment. We don't know asymptotics for it. But on the other hand, you can still do it because you can combine it with the Selberg cell. So you can get upper bounds of the right order of magnitude for the first moment in the family of primes, even with an amplifier, because you can put in the Selberg cell for free. Okay, so, so then all of the, the rest of the arguments will go through and you will get the right upper bounds for, uh, tight upper bounds for moments on, uh, for moments. You also get the central limit theorem, the upper bounds in the central limit theorem conjecture, uh, precisely the, without any loss, I should say, uh, when if you restrict yourself to prime discriminant. That was not my question. <laughs> I said, what about L prime? If you look at the family of Lewis, <laughs> for which the yes. one? You can, you can do L prime as well. Yeah, yeah. If you, look at, if you look at the odd twist, you can do that, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the one other ingredient that's used is the positivity of the L values. I did not emphasize this before. And for L prime, that's still okay. You have by gross Sargier the positivity of values and then, and then everything else is okay. So by having all these bounds on all the moments, can you get better percentages of non-zeros? No, so this is a question that I mentioned in my last lecture, that, uh, or two lectures back, uh, that the, the interesting problem here would be to get lower bounds for these small moments, for the moments less than one. Now we have the upper bounds, but we don't know lower bounds. If you have lower bounds for all the moments less than one, then you would get, unconditionally, you would get a positive proportion of non-vanishing in this family which is still not known. Right. Thank you.
Yes, one more. It's interesting that the lower bound for the average of elf central value zero functions of 20 D runs over a very special number of right? So it's much more formally from Ramsey to the top of the because that's beautiful identity. But that's a very, very sparse set. That's a that's a, you have in mind a very sparse set, like S units, or? No, very sparse, like the uh, <coughs> DX is actually the square root of X. Ah, okay. But, but, uh, but uh, so not prime, it's got low bound. The other bound is type of theory possibilization. You can use the value of set that's equal, whatever other can see. So you mean like sums of two squares, or? or yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that is too bad. Just opposite, when, when you allow in D primes, which, uh, do not, which, uh, do not, no, yeah. I see, only primes compo composed of three mod four primes. Okay. Okay, but still, Interesting, I have, yeah. It is a recent work of codes, which can change, but it's required to work on. Is this the new thing of Why are you doing that? Uh, say it again? Why are you choosing these discriminants? Uh, yeah, well, he knows that. Yeah, he actually just asked me these questions and he met, you know, and uh, tried to explain and he failed to explain. Well, it's a legit thing. We should really see it in, in, in the particular problem. So of course, there's some work of Munchi on kind of related things where you you, yeah, but quite. Right, but Munchi, but that's Munchi. Yeah. Anyway, it's just the interesting well. subject to 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 call people to do now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's something that I is hopefully a hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> they need us. <laughs> Then let's thank uh, Sam for the full <laughs>